All right, well, thank you guys all for coming out. This is uh, season two of 52 Weeks of Reefing. The problem I'm gonna tackle today is the biggest problem I see is in the hobby is we all know what the individual components of a reef tank do today or does today, but there's almost no consensus on how we use it. So 52 Weeks of Reefing, number one, a lot of us didn't know what carbon was or how it actually works. Does it work? What a skimmer does, what lights are, and how it all works. We learned then. But uh, essentially what we did is we didn't learn how to bake a cake. I just told you what uh, flour was and what baking soda was and what chip, uh, uh, chocolate chips were. We didn't really actually figure out how to assemble it. Now we did assemble it in one way and built the BRS-160, which was successful. But I think there is a methodology we can go beyond that. There's no underlying belief structure that guides us or binds the ideas into something stronger than individual components. Today, we're going to solve that. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we've done a whole bunch of series here, uh, going all the way back to 2011. Me and Reed in my basement uh, doing a series on how to start a water, saltwater tank. There was 2013, uh, Saltwater Aquarium Basics. 2014, we did the clown harem tank. Everybody told us that that couldn't be done. Can't set up a tank with 30 clownfish in it. In fact, more than two will kill them. Turns out 30 can. Uh, 2015, it was 52 weeks of reefing. Everybody here has had they seen that one. There is the ULM where we tried to make it a little bit easier. Uh, we did the uh, hit up the pros with BRS uh, WWC method and how the pros reef. And then we did the five minute guide, which we tried to make it really simple for entry level. You don't need to know every last thing about all the science behind carbon. Just put it in there and it'll pull out the yellow, right? All right, so there's a couple in here that I was uh, particularly proud of that excite me the most. Uh, and we're trying to emulate that for the future. And one of them is actually the clown harem. And the reason that I like the clown harem one so much is because what that one did is think about the animals first. And so what we thought about is a habitat and the dietary needs and aggression, uh, food aggression and habitat aggression. And how do we manage this community of fish that we're told can't be done? And when we thought about the animals and not about ourselves, it actually panned out and we were able to keep these guys alive for five years. Uh, only thing re reason we took it down is because the tank was bowing and it looked like it was going to explode. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's one up here that I actually don't like quite a bit, uh, which is uh, the ULM. Who here watched the ULM series? Okay, you know what? Those tanks didn't do very well. And you know what, why it didn't do well? It's because I built this one for myself. I was thinking about how do I make it easier? And how do I make, uh, spend less time with the tank? That was selfish, that was about me. It wasn't about the animals in the tank and because of that, it didn't perform as well as the others. There's also one in here that I really like and ultimately if you came to BRS you would probably agree that this one is actually probably the most successful of the bunch. So this is the uh, WWC hybrid tank. Uh, it's a 900, it's up front. If you come to Minnesota, you can come see it. Uh, does this look like a successful tank to you guys? Yeah, okay, so I think anybody would be happy with this one. The 160 is awesome too, but uh, give me this one as much time as those and this one will actually be better. It already is pretty epic. This is the result of when uh, the people, the pros that do it, meet the people that do it at home and we build out systems uh, that can be successful. So in this, uh, in 52 weeks season two, we're gonna apply everything that we learned since 2015. It's a whole way, new way of looking at this. We're not looking at the individual components. We get past an aquarium build and we embrace the real goal, which is a sustainable artificial ecosystem that supports uh, fish and coral off the reef. In fact, we're going to build multiple ecosystems. So it's not going to be just one mixed tank. And so if you guys got any ideas of uh, what type of tanks you would like to see us build, let us know. Because each one of these things is going to be modified to the intended uh, artificial environment that we're going to build. Uh, you can, if you're watching this later, you can put it in the YouTube comments as well. Uh, we do that best by emulating uh, uh, the best in the world at uh, supporting life in a foreign environment, NASA. A lot of people don't think of people going to space is the same as a reef tank. You'll see why that isn't the case. Uh, it's actually very similar. So for that reason, we're going to call this presentation Sustaining Fish and Coral Beyond the Reef. Uh, we're taking these things out of the ocean. We're going to put them in Minnesota. We're going to take care of them. It's LSS lessons from NASA. That's life support systems, uh, for those of you who don't know. Uh, and this isn't necessarily NASA endorsed, but uh, uh, the information they share is a great source of inspiration for those who want to maintain life outside of natural habitats for prolonged periods of time. In this case, we're actually going to change it to RSS, which is a reef support system, which has a little bit better ring to it than life support. <laughs> uh, and it won't be by NASA, it'll be by BRS TV. But today you're going to learn how to create a sustainable uh, uh, artificial ecosystem. 
you're going to see the architecture that's based on environmental needs and not a shopping list. So we're not talking about a protein skimmer anymore. We're talking about water pollution. And we can learn how a protein skimmer might actually be a solution to uh, helping us filter our water. But the problem isn't what skimmer do I need, it's how do I filter the water out. And the support system that manages all of that long term. And uh, I always start these things with uh, don't poke the bear. Today I'm going to poke the bear harder than I've ever poked it before because this is the environment where we get honest with each other and we really tell each other what needs to be heard because it's better to disappoint people with the truth than appease them with a lie. And it's hard because we don't always want to hear the things that some people share, uh, but I just ask that everybody opens their mind for today. The appeasing lie is reefing is easy. Anyone can do it with any amount of time uh, or resources. It's just an aquarium. Now, it's true that when we all started the first time we did this, it was just an aquarium. That's just the way it was. Uh, we set it up. I wanted to put some fish in it, and then I learned about it later. That was 20 years ago. Uh, fish and corals just magically die. It's an appeasing lie. It's, uh, we actually did something wrong. There's something about the environment that causes these things to die in a vast majority of cases. Uh, these two mentalities are intertwined. And it's this council that prioritizes personal desires or agendas over the animals. And the success rates for the people that believe these things are low and the animals that they care for. That's the lie that a lot of people have been told. The truth today is that supporting fish and coral off the reef is a direct, uh, direct result of deliberate approaches to chemistry, biology, and environmental technology. Success is defined by how uh, the health of the animals that we care for, not how well it looks. Hopefully the go, uh, both those things go hand in hand. The count, this council respects those animals and those that rely on us to care for them. And the success rates for these people are high for those who believe it and the animals that we care for. If you're sitting in this room, you're probably already in this group. I got some inspiration. It's five years in the making. I got inspiration from a, a thought leader in reefing. Uh, for those that successfully keep organisms alive in four of an environment, and those I share a belief structure with. Uh, this is Ishan. Uh, does anybody know him? Have ever seen any of the uh, talks that he's done? He's actually the owner of Triton. I watched this seminar uh, in 2017, and it really hit home for me. It's the foundation of this thing. And he shared that he was the, the core of building a reef aquarium environment was actually a three-legged table, and it was based on chemistry light and filtration. And it just so happens that if you get chemistry, light, and filtration right, the net result is biology in the center. And since that day, I've been thinking about this concept. I happen to think that it's more than three legs. But ever since then, I've been thinking about how does this all fit together and that it isn't just about buying a protein skimmer or a light or uh, you know, a, a new bottle of two-part. It's how these things build together to support the biology of the animals. And this is the purpose or the why, the reason that we do all of this stuff uh, with chemistry, light, and bi uh, biology. But really, I think there's another leg. It's called waves and currents. I think there's another leg. It's called habitats. It's not just stacking some rock in there. We can do better than that. And it's uh, fish nutrition. This is an area where I think that we're all lacking as well. Uh, thermal energy, uh, coral nutrition, disease. All of these legs uh, are things that if we're going to manage a, a, a biology of a lot of animals, if we do these things well, the net result of this is just healthy biology. I was also inspired by NASA. Uh, a few years ago, I started calling this stuff life support, right? Because uh, it just dawned on me that a heater really isn't just a heater. This is a, a method of maintaining thermal energy in the aquarium. And if we stop maintaining the thermal energy, everything dies. Right? If I put light in there, it's not a light. It's actually a way of finding photosynthetic energy to the corals. If I don't do it right, everything dies. So these are life support. What I didn't like was it conjured up ideas of the hospital for me. Right? It, didn't like, it just didn't, wasn't a positive message. So I went to look about how people do it in a different environment, which was NASA. And they actually still call it life support systems. But instead of taking people with an unhealthy and turning them into healthy like a hospital, they're keeping people that are healthy already are already healthy, keeping them healthy. And that's what we want to do as well. Uh, and so they also call it sustaining humans beyond Earth. 
And that's why I called it sustaining corals, fishing corals beyond the reef. These are inspirations for me. And they build that simplified uh, life support schematics to do that environmental controls. And then that's where it comes in. It's not light. It's photosynthetic energy. It's not filtration. It's water pollution. And as boring as it is, it's electricity that supports all this stuff. If there's no electricity, then it doesn't work. And uh, it's really mundane. You don't want to think about it, but it's true. And it's not biology. Because biology means, like, how do I build all this stuff for a fish? How do I build it for a crab, a snail, or uh, 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 any type of coral? This is actually a biome or ecosphere of life that's in the tank. How all of these things build together, and they all have totally different needs. So I've got to get all of these right for all of them. Another inspiration for me was the Golden Circle. Uh, and this is Simon Sinek. And uh, this is probably the most watched uh, TikTok of all time. It's like in the top three. Borrowed this, and he has the what, how, and why people do things. And so I borrowed this, and I changed it a little bit for reefing. There's a what in here, which is uh, every reefer on the planet knows what we're doing. We're building an aquarium and maintaining, a, or building and maintaining a beautiful aquarium full of fish and coral. Everyone got that one. I think everybody in the entire room. How we do it is a little different. Some reefers know how we do it. These are the things that make them more successful than others and around them, a method, a list of equipment, timing, or a critical mentality uh, 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 that guides all of the decisions. The people that can share this with other people and replicate it and do it more than once on their own, those are probably the best hows. The list of stuff that I would do, it works more than once, not just in the case of myself. But the why, this is the part that we miss, and if we do this right, then we'll guide all of the how and the what. The why is very few reefers know why they design the systems that they do. Why has nothing to do with a pile of skimmers. It has nothing to do with pumps or lights or how we install them. Why is a purpose or a cause, an underlying belief, the very reason that we're able to sustain fish and corals uh, beyond the reef successfully. And my why is I believe that fish and coral success is my success. These things are inseparable. When I design a sustainable environment for them rather than myself, we both win. My goal is a beautiful, awesome aquarium full of fish and coral that are thriving and live for a very long time. So when I think about them first, I'll be more successful, and that's the example of the ULM thing. I went and I violated this back then. I didn't know it, right? But when I thought about uh, the clownfish and I thought about their habitat, I was successful. So these things reward us when we think about them first. So let's do it together. So lesson number one, it's all life support. This is where the NASA bit comes in. So uh, NASA calls it LSS. We call it RSS, but insert, insert whatever. Uh, organisms die. I hate to say the negative here, but we'll get through the negative of it. But on one side of that wall there, those astronauts are alive. On the other side, they're not. On one side of the wall of that aquarium, they're alive. On one side, they're not. They need a habitat or an enclosure. And more importantly, they actually need uh, things in there that make them feel secure and safe and engaged. You know, Otherwise, they'll probably go out of their mind. Fish too. Uh, we also need temperature management. Sometimes it's super duper cold in space. Sometimes it's super, super hot. Same thing in our aquariums. We need a man way to manage thermal energy in there. Uh, we need nutrition. There's no food in space. You need to send up food. There's no food in our glass boxes. We've got to put food in. If they don't, then they'll die. The pollution management, uh, everything that goes in the tank is polluting it. Everything that goes into the air uh, in the uh, space station is pollution. We've got to get out. We've got to die. The oxygen environment, we've got to put oxygen into the tank, into space. If we don't, all of a sudden, everybody dies. And if you're wondering if that's true, uh, hold your breath for about 30 seconds to remind you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, CO2 management, you breathe out, it's toxic. Uh, if we don't get it out, everybody dies. Electricity, electricity goes out. All that stuff goes out, everybody dies. Okay, so uh, as sad as that is, it's, it's, we gotta get that into our mentality, is what we're really building is an artificial ecosystem, and every one of those things that we're building are designed to support the life there. And in some ways, I believe what we're doing is actually more difficult than putting people in space. That sounds crazy, right? Because you've got to send a rocket ship up there and put them up there, and it's super uh, tough to do. But our mission isn't measured in months, but in many years. And I believe the longest person in time anybody's been in space is like 350 days. Okay, Who has a tank here that's longer than 350 days? 
That's the whole room, man. You're doing it longer than NASA does, and we're doing it uh, uh, a, on a, less, a smaller budget. We have uh, not the same team of engineers or biolog uh, biologists working 24-7. It's a single person that works, sleeps, vacation, and has other priorities in our life. It's part of why it's harder. We're doing it on a fraction of the budget. You know, we're taking some of our take-home pay and we're allocating it to this. It's not an infinite budget that NASA was getting. Uh, we're doing it with hobby-grade technology that favors marketable features in retail sales over reliability, but not always. Uh, we're doing it with an individual person, a plant or an animal. Uh, it's not an individual in person, plant or animal. It's an entire ecosystem of organisms, bacteria, microcrustaceans, fish, coral predators, and parasites, all living in balance with each other in a closed environment, which is different than just trying to keep a human being alive in space. Does that sound hurt hard? Sure. It's not a hamster that we're trying to keep here. Uh, it's something much more complex than that. Uh, but today, you're going to hear that clear path to success and understand why it works. The reason that it works, again, is it prioritizes the fish and corals' needs over their own, the same way that NASA does. They're not trying to do it uh, specific to a lot of things. Their primary goal is keep people alive. That's our goal. So how does NASA do it? They build a, a goal. I don't know if we all have defined the goal together, but we probably should, because if we have the same goal, we'll probably have the same results. Their goal is just sustaining humans beyond Earth. Uh, they build out a system architecture here to tell you how it works. There's urine, uh, comes out of the human being, goes into a urine processor, goes into a, a condenser to add moisture to the air. Some of it's processed and fed uh, back into the uh, potable water system. There's a carbon dioxide scrubber. There's a trace element control system for filtering all this stuff out because all of this has some kind of unintended consequences when uh, you filter things out or you add new things. They need to figure out, same thing with the reef tank. Uh, uh, they have environmental monitoring. So if it was worth installing, is it worth knowing whether or not it works? I think the answer is yes. And more importantly, if a fire breaks out, do you want to wait until somebody sees it? Or should an alarm go off? If the heat stops working, should we wait until it gets cold? Or should we go uh, you know, have an alarm go off and, and tell us? So we have the systems. We have the goals. We know what we're trying to keep. And we have some monitors that go off and tell us. There's also atmosphere management and uh, water management. So basically, there's some kind of system in there that's turning stuff on and off, you know, telling you to turn up the heat, turn down the heat, uh, uh, you know, manage all the carbon dioxide that's having all up there. So how does RSS do it? Well, our goal is sustaining fish and corals beyond the reef. And I'm going to tell you, when we have this one goal unified together, we'll probably achieve it. But when we add in things like, uh, the goal is sustaining fish and corals beyond the reef the cheapest and easiest possible way. That has a different trajectory. Uh, it isn't necessarily that. We all have a budget. There's no way around that. But we can figure out how we're going to allocate it to this one goal. All right, well, build out the system architecture. You know, so we'll have a simplified water schematic. We'll build out schematics for the entire thing so we understand how these things actually feed each other uh, and they produce the results that we want. Because once we understand what all the goals are and what the challenges are and what happens when we do it wrong, we'll be able to build out the technology better. We'll also stand uh, environmental monitoring. And the monitoring doesn't have to be technology, by the way. Uh, if I want to know if my pumps are working, I can s just blow some bubbles right into the pump and watch them go around. I can see that the water's moving around the same way. There are technology options uh, out there to d tell you this stuff as well, but it doesn't have to be those things, and we can pick out where we want to allocate our budget to the things that are the most valuable. We're also going to look at the RSS management tool. So on the space station, what we would do is we'd design the damn thing from scratch, and we'd spend $8 billion to, you know, developing each thing. We don't do that here in reefing. We buy the tools off the shelf that are already doing this. But what I'm going to ask everybody to do here is let go of your brand. Who cares about the brand? The brand isn't the solution. The product isn't the solution. And we need to figure out each one of these pumps does something totally different than the other one. They perform differently. They're the right tool for the right job in different instances. Let's forget our brand favorites and let's just pick the option that supports the life in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the tank the best, the best. And then there's RSS, brand ma uh, or RSS management controllers. You know, and people sometimes say, uh, I'm the controller. Well, you know what the controller is then of a heater? When the heat hits a, a 78, I'm going to unplug it. Uh, when it hits 77, I'm going to plug it back in. 
Uh, that's not true. Man. Actually, our whole system has billions of little controllers on it. We have a temperature controller. It's that little thing on the end of your Phoenix heater. It's a little box, right? Our controller on our lights. It could be a timer. It's turning it on and off. It's a controller. It could be the uh, integrated solutions. But basically, everything that's on the pump has a controller of some type managing the environment for us, right? Uh, and these would be the primary thing, uh, uh, primary schematics that we'll build out to be able to support this type of life, right? We're going to build out a water movement schematic, uh, a uh, photosynthetic energy schematic, a habitat, pollution, nutrient, thermal energy, disease, and electricity. Uh, no way me, I'll find three more along the way. Uh, so this one is photosynthetic energy that you're going to see. This bit today, uh, even you, Terrence, today. You're going to learn something about lighting that you never learned before. You're going to understand it in a way that you've never understand it before. Because I'm going to tell you, I understand it better than I ever stand before when I took all the things I know and I put pen to paper. Today will be, you will look at this different, and hopefully you'll be able to describe it to other people differently as well. Most call it, which light do I buy? Let's fix that. RSS number two. It's the primary source of energy for protein for the corals, energy and protein. So this is how the schematic would work. Photosynthetic energy, we call it light. Uh, if you have the right spectrum, the right intensity, and the right coverage, uh, combine that with CO2 and water, the zooxanthellae will turn that into glucose, glycerol, amino acids, and then the coral will turn that into energy and protein to build this tissue. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the way that the zooxanthellae does that is it utilizes chlorophyll A, C2, and carotenoids. Chlorophyll A, C2, and carotenoids will absorb the energy from their light and transfer it to the zooxanthellae. All right, so this all seems pretty easy, right? I don't know. It kind of sounds like I'm going to turn a light on and uh, be done with it. So why is lighting likely the most significant cause of mortalities in the last decade? And the answer is the difference between good and bad. The wrong intensity has definitely killed an enormous amount of animals in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, when we decided to have par wars and we were shooting for six, seven, eight hundred par all through all the tank, we were just killing stuff left and right, right? Uh, and all of the thought leaders back then were telling us that was the right way to do it. Meanwhile, just animals are dying. And everybody's looking the other way, saying the words, oh, I don't know, these things just die, that's the way it is. Wrong. We manage environmental process for these animals wrong. And it's like, I don't know if we were just blind to it or unwilling to admit it, but that's the way it is. And I'll tell you what, nobody can really guess. Paul explain to you why that is not true, why that's true as well. We also have the uh, wrong coverage. All right, you look at this image. I can tell you, 100 out of 100 of you, which would pick, uh, which of these lights you would pick. Because one of these lights wraps that coral, uh, the dead coral skeleton, wraps it in light in a way I don't see any shadows. I don't see any shadows uh, behind the coral. I don't see any shadows in the in inner network of the coral. And then there's the one over there where there's huge, super hard shadows behind it. It means whatever was behind it is going to be shadow and did not receive the photosynthetic energy that this organism needs to live. And more importantly, if you look in its inner network, it's shading itself. It's not going to get its own energy. I know which one you'd pick. Uh, also within there is the chlorophyll A, C2, and carotenoids. You're going to learn more about those in a way that anybody, and raise your hand if you know how that all works. Nobody. Everyone here. Oh, there's one. Uh, everyone here is going to leave saying, oh my, I didn't know, but now I do, and I'll know how to apply it to an actual use as well, which is going to be cool. All right. One of those uses is actually, we're going to make the corals look better, too. I'm going to teach you why that, how you can use light to look at these corals. This is the exact same coral. These are totally untouched. I just took them. Uh, we took the, uh, the video of it. And uh, it is the exact same coral. We're just illuminating it differently, one good, one less so. Uh, but the net result of this, if we get wrong spectrum, wrong intensity, and wrong coverage wrong, we're not going to produce uh, glucose, glycerol, amino acids, or uh, energy or protein. And that's why things are going wrong. So why has uh, getting the lighting right been so hard? And we need to put this to bed. So this is largely the transition from uh, T5s and LEDs. Who here runs T5s or has in their life? A lot of people. Uh, does those, do those things support coral? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, OK, we switched to LEDs. The problem was is we shifted the technology to LEDs. We did it for ourselves. We did not do this for the coral, because uh, this is my first tank here. Uh, this thing was thriving. Man, I had all kinds of corals in it. I had SPS corals, I had clams in here, whatever. Like, they didn't care about my desires. They were doing just fine under this light. 
Uh, when I switched LEDs, it wasn't because of that. It was because halides and T5s were big and ugly, right? Uh, that big, huge, giant, you know, halide fixture is huge. I need a hood for it. The color was just okay. I was constantly trying to change the bulbs out until I got the color I want. But it always kind of looked this like Windexy color that I wasn't really happy with. It was too white, it was too blue, it was something. Uh, and uh, most of them were like ceiling mounted, which I had to drill holes in my ceiling. Personally, I don't care, but a lot of people do. Uh, they required bulb changes. Nobody likes required changing bulbs. The highlights were too hot. It just wasn't cool. Uh, anybody think fluorescent tubes are cool? Because I don't think there's anybody in the world to say that. Uh, and that might sound silly, but like, hey, the, the person that sets this up likes cool stuff. Everybody in the room here wants to do something cool. Like you are unique animals. You like doing something that other people don't do. This isn't a normal thing to keep these animals in your house. So it's just kind of the nature is that I want to go after the cool stuff. And T5s didn't have the punch. BS. That turned out to be total crap. Uh, but everybody was saying that back then. Uh, we also see rapport council at, at the time. You know, back in the day, uh, thought leaders were telling us more par was better. That council defined our purchases. And we were chasing the sun rather than the tank. So like people were going out measuring the sun in the you know, middle of a reef at noon in the middle of summer and coming out with 1,500 par is our goal. Uh, we'll later find out that's crap. Uh, and that a lot of these corals are actually uh, having the best photosynthesis rates in the morning, in the evening, and then during the day, they're actually just protecting themselves. And a lot of these guys live 40 feet down, not uh, you're measuring six, feet, six inches under the water. Right? Okay, we're also testing uh, done in air, which is a gross misrepresentation. And I can tell you there's little par meters down there, but you know what I can tell? That that was a gross misrepresentation of how this light performs? Look at the wall. It's illuminating the wall more than the ground. Right, and like all that par is spilling out into the room. You know, I'm not measuring it. It's just going all over the place. It's not going to my little two foot grid that it's supposed to. But that's not how light behaves in a glass box full of water. See that little laser? The light refracts in once it hits the water. It hits then the glass and then it bounces back into the tank. So essentially when we had that super wide angle light that was coming from the T5s, it was creating an almost like infinite amount of new light beams shooting around the tank, coating it in the tank. This is like the best possible light source that we could use. Yet our testing methods told us it didn't have enough punch. Wrong. Uh, the demand for punch and par caused the LED manufacturers to start the par wars and get an increasingly focused uh, uh, lenses, trying to shoot this down and beat the test, right? Uh, and so we were getting like 1,300 par. We were getting, you know, right at the bottom, maybe 600 par. And this guy actually nailed it. This is 2010. He figured that out. This is a two-foot cubish tank, and it looks like he mounted it over two feet off the tank just to try to solve this problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, uh, the, what the, like, why, man? The fluorescent lighting was working just fine, but why do you want the apparatus? I don't get it. Uh, okay, so, uh, but a majority of people didn't even, didn't do this. They didn't go to that uh, extent uh, and uh, test par and figure out the mic mounting height. They just uh, treated it like it was the plug and play, and they just killed everything when they plugged in their LEDs. And sadly, the good counsel was also not as loud as the bad. There's people like Dana Riddle out there that is out going doing the testing, right? So Dana would go out and test Parides coral in the tide pools in Florida and find out not just uh, what the par is, but what's the rate of photosynthesis at those par times during the day, right? And what he would find is for this tide pool Parides coral, uh, it 110 par is where the saturation point was. This is for a coral that lives in a couple inches to a couple of feet of water. Right? And the saturation point is 110 par. I mean, past that, there's limited returns, and it totally caps out at 200 par. After that, it really doesn't matter. What he also would go on to tell us is that uh, you take the exact same coral that isn't sitting right in the top of the coral, and it's actually just a side. Right? It's just shaded a little bit. Well, this one, if we get up past 200, it actually does photo inhibition. It's going to slow down the rate of photosynthesis past 200. Now you could say that maybe it's just uh, intelligently like shutting down photosynthesis uh, to save itself from being poisoned, or maybe it's actually just being poisoned, 
right, and slowing down photosynthesis because we're killing the coral with too much light. But people like Dana are kind of like hidden. And in fact, if you get a chance, just go read everything that Dana's ever done because uh, you'll find out he answered questions that we're all asking thir you know, 13 years ago. Uh, and and uh, the problem is, is we go to a forum, we ask a question, 30 people answer, two people are right. But we tend to look for the people that agree with the thing that we were thinking already and just pick those two instead. Uh, Dana would also go on to test uh, all kinds of uh, different lights. You probably can't read it from here, but there's a bunch of Acropora. Top of uh, Acroporas, the photosaturation fat, the, the photosaturation rate, meaning like where there's limited return, was actually 72 par, 102 par. But there's also down at the bottom, you're 400, right? So it's dependent on the specific coral. But what you'll find is most of them will find that range somewhere around two to 300 par is where they will adapt to it. And these are amazingly adaptive creatures. Like that one Paritis, it adapted to the fact that it was being shaded on one side, but the top had adapted to higher light. The corals will do the same, so that's why we find these zones, and it isn't 1,500, it's actually around two to 300. All right, and this is also worldwide corals. These guys are absolutely successful, and I know that because they're producing them at rates at which you guys can all buy them. Uh, they're growing them fast, and they're growing them colorful in a way that you would actually want them. Uh, almost every single point in here, two to 300 par. Right? We know the answer now. This is odd, though, too. The good options back then just weren't popular. You know, they were out there. They existed. This was 2012. Uh, we shot a video about the uh, Vertex Illumina. Anybody remember that thing? Yeah. OK, so uh, it's got six little pucks of light going across the side there. Uh, it actually looks a lot like what we're doing today. Uh, but it's like closely spaced. They're just a few inches apart. This is a 40 gallon breeder, man. It's only 36 inches wide, which means you've got one of these things spaced every six inches. And the light's actually wide too, so it's probably only three and a half inches apart. But nobody bought it because they were big when small was cool. Nobody knew. We didn't know what we were, how we were messing it up. And three times 500 bucks is a lot cheaper than 1,500 bucks, right? Not really. But like in our minds, it is, I'm going to shop and I see 1500 bucks. Oh, I don't want that. It's too expensive. But I'm really definitely willing to look at a $500 light. I kind of think I need two. I've come to the conclusion I get three, and it seems like a better deal. <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing because it's true. Uh, uh, but all that was not about us. It was a, or that was all about us, not about the animals, right? Uh, because the animals were living just fine under that light right, right there, uh, same period of time. All right. So. Doesn't that look an awful lot like this? Uh, this is three little pucks on top of a tank. Uh, man, that looks like a similar approach. You know, the difference though, this is also a 40 breeder. The difference here though is we learned raising the lights up uh, actually uh, helps a lot with the distribution. So I don't necessarily need six if I'm willing to raise them up. Uh, in this case, the owner of this or the designer of this light really liked having the fixture really low to the tank because aesthetically that was his preference. And so in that case, he spread out six of these things because it, he was unwilling to raise them up way above the tank. All right, so often it looks a lot like that. This is a lot of approaches that people are doing SPS tanks now. It's a grid of lights, right? And even more intelligently, uh, and if you, once you think about it, you'll see it right away, but a cone of light goes out like this. So what happens when I fill the whole thing with cones of light? They all intersect in the center. And it gets really, really bright in the center. We create a big hot spot. So in this case, if we want to get super nerdy about it, we just turn down the center ones 40%, and all of a sudden what we get is 78% of the entire tank is in that SPS zone. 78, man, of like 190 points throughout this uh, uh, tank, we're able to get into the sweet spot when we zone it out like that. This one's interesting. I'm going to call it before it's time in real time. Does anybody here use uh, only LED strips to light their tanks? Not one of you, right? I don't know why. Uh, you're going to learn later about why this is actually probably a really great option. Uh, but uh, you can see here. 87% of it was in there. These things are inexpensive. They're super easy to install. But they just aren't cool in the same fashion, right? Uh, so uh, before it's time, even though you can go get it right now. Uh, spectrum. Next up. Almost no one knows what good looks like. Let's fix that. You're going to find out right now what the good looks like from a coral health perspective, as well as what good looks like from a perspective of, I want these things to look awesome because the way that I appreciate my tank is visually. So uh, chlorophyll A, C2 carotenoids. What is this? This is telling you where these things can absorb energy. 
where they're able to pull light energy out and turn it into energy uh, for the zooxanthellae and coral, essentially. And they're really fine peaks, right? Uh, it's really, really small. So what are these nanometers in the corner? When people says, uh, say, uh, I want a peak at 660 nanometers, that's nerd for a very specific type of light, right? So the reason that we say it that way, though, is because the blue band's actually really big. Uh, it's 400 to 500. And if I said 480, I know that you're talking about like a tealy blue. And if you said uh, uh, 420, I know you're talking about kind of a deeper purplish blue. But in general, if we were just going to talk about this like color, it'd be blue, right? So if we want to uh, talk about it in a little geekier fashion, we just nail the actual point. And uh, if you knew all this stuff, which you guys will, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. So why is it colored? It's because people like myself need a visual representation of what the hell you're talking about. So when I talk about 660, man, what color is that? Red. Yeah, it's red. You nailed it. Uh, all right. So when I talk about 380, what, is that, what am I talking about? It's like purple-violet color, right? All right. So when I'm talking about 450, I'm talking about green light, right? So uh, it's there so that when we talk about some of these numbers, you can say, oh, that's green light. Oh, that's purple light. It just brings it all together. All right, so how could I use these to know if one is better than the other? Like if I'm out shopping for lights and I wanted to like pick one light or another one based on this spectrum thing, it's all in the peaks. So right here, uh, this is a, a chlorophyll A peak. So just so you know, uh, I believe that you can't have a coral without chlorophyll A. All the science and research I've had is it's impossible for a coral to live without chlorophyll A. So that's why we hit the peak. And so what does that peak mean? Like what happens if we missed that peak and we were over here just a little bit? It does not utilize the light to the same degree. And in fact, it, loses, it uses it to like something like 80% less, which means it would still use this light. I just need 80% more, eight times, or like probably five times as much of this, which would be a huge waste of energy and it would probably look really wonky in the tank as well. So the closer out in nailing that very specific peak, the more efficient the lights are, the better they are for the animals. There's also a secondary peak here right around 400. So this is still chlorophyll A, but these things kind of add up together. And there might even be some beneficial to uh, violet near UV lights as well. Chlorophyll T C2. This one's interesting because uh, not only does it provide energy, but it actually has capability of passing energy to chlorophyll A. You don't really have to think about this one, though, because uh, that one, is in every cool white channel, in every royal blue channel, in every, t uh, every system that we buy. So this one you're going to nail by default. This one, oddly enough, is missing from so many. And I just said the sentence of no coral can survive without chlorophyll A. And for some reason, it's missing from so many. How could that be? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, so this is carotenoids over here, too. So carotenoids not as important as the other two, but it also is a method of energy collection. And one of the things that it's missing in most of these lights is that little area I circled, which is that like tealy blue. OK. So which one is more important? It's not really uh, 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 this isn't a known quantity. Like people, uh, you could ask anybody, and, and most uh, uh, scientists would tell you I don't know. They'd know that I know all three of these are important. So let's treat them as such. And because I just told you C2 is going to happen by default with all of these lights, we don't really have to think about that one a whole lot. But we should think about the carotenoids in A and how they add together. And I'll tell you what, when you think about them together, it also comes out to look like an awesome coral. I'm going to show you in a second. All right. So uh, when we look at all those peaks, these are four different light sources on the bottom. This is an ATI Blue Plus bulb. And uh, those are three LED options, right? So uh, we've called this guy the gold standard for a long time, right? So uh, you guys have heard me say that many, many times. The, the ATI Blue Plus is the gold standard. Why? Well, I just popped up that red line there. That red line is the uh, a A2 primary peak, right? It nailed it. It's carrying it all the way to the top. It's also missing a little bit of the, uh, or not missing, has very little of the secondary peak uh, of, the, uh, of the chlorophyll A. But it doesn't really matter because we nailed the first peak. It also nails the second, or the C2 peak. And it also does really, really well with the carotenoids. Now, we know why this light actually produced the type of results that it did. It's because it's hitting the biology of how we understand photosynthetic energy and how corals actually utilize this stuff. And then we apply it to the next one. So the next light here, the LED light, that's chlorophyll A now. That peg uh, uh, is way, 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 way down there. It's just basically missing this spectrum of light. 
and it's also missing the secondary peak. Like I said, though, it's hitting the C2 peak, right? Uh, and it's also missing the carotenoid peak. So will this, cor this light kill coral? And the answer is maybe, and some, but probably not all. So uh, in many cases, what would happen here is the coral will adjust the ratio of chlorophyll A and C2 to be able to try to survive in the environment that you created for it. They're amazingly adaptive creatures. Now, that's to say, not all of them make it. That's where that sentence of, I don't know, corals just die, right? Some of them? Well, these ones did, <laughs> right? But the problem was probably that we just didn't care about the environment that it was in. And just because they all didn't die in a mass extinction event, uh, somehow I'm still doing it good, right? Okay, so this is the next one. So you hit the A2 there pretty good. You will uh, actually hit the, uh, or, or the, the primary peak of A, the pri secondary peak we totally missed yet again. Uh, and this one's kind of weird because we didn't hit 450. We actually, this thing was optimized for 460, which is like right over here instead. I don't know why that would be. Maybe they think they know something better than us. Uh, maybe uh, it's a binning process. They just, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but you can buy LEDs in bins, and they, you can pay extra to have them test every last one and make sure it's right on the nose. Or you can pay less, and they'll just kind of give you close, right? I don't know why that is, but they missed it. But it's not that big a deal. It's not like they missed it grossly. And this wouldn't affect uh, how you grow coral. Like if you missed this just like a little bit, you would never turn out in a result that you would feel or see. Uh, and you can also see that it hits the carotenoids. This one's interesting though. This one here uh, hits A, but it actually has a secondary peak down there and hits the only one out of all of it that it hits the violet channel, right? And so remember that the chlorophyll A is actually two, two peaks, right? The secondary. Now, this might not be perfect science, but you can actually add them together if you wanted to represent how much energy that these things are actually getting. Uh, and it nails the C and the carotenoids as well. All right, so now you can choose one of these things pretty intelligently. And basically, this one's easy and healthy. This one's good enough. Uh, this one's healthy and adjustable. And this is healthy, adjustable, and a wide color gambit. You can decide for yourself. But can you see the color gambit? Can you see this with your naked eye? And the answer is absolutely. Because if you don't have violet light, you can't see violet. And the reason the way that color pigments work is I shine violet light at something, and it has the right pigment, it will bounce violet light back at my eye. If I don't have any violet light, there's no violet light to bounce at my eye. So if I'm missing these spectrums, it just won't exist in our tank, even if your coral has it. So here's an example. So this is a, 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 a coral out of uh, the WWC tank that we took at the top. Uh, and uh, this is just the uh, cool white channel. It looks exactly what you'd think, which is like dirty brown, right? And the reason it's brown is because it's filled with green, yellow, and red, and that just all kinds of blends together to create a browny, ugly coral. But let's add in that A peak with the violet channel. All of a sudden, it starts to come alive. All of a sudden, that purple pigment that was in there, we can now see. If we didn't have the purple pigment, you wouldn't see it at all. And more importantly, you can actually see, start to see the green fluorescence of the polyps as well. And for those of you who don't know, uh, fluorescence is a little bit different than pigment, because we're shining violet light here. And I just told you, it should, should, should go back of your eye at violet, right? Well, what fluorescence does is it absorbs high energy light down in the blue spectrum and then re-emits it back out at your eye in a different lower energy spectrum like green, red, or orange. So it's actually changing the color of light and then coming back at you. And what it does is it creates a really cool contrast because what I've done with color pinks make, make it purple. But then the thing right next to it is green. It's really cool. That's why these things tend to pop. Let's put, turn on the royal blue channel. Again, we start to see uh, purple that comes out of it. Now, which, if you were buying a coral, you want that brown one up there, or do you want the purple one? Well, the answer is, it's the same damn coral. I'm just shining a different light on it, <laughs> right? And, and, and more importantly, uh, I'm adding the C2 peaks. These are the exact same peaks that are good for the, uh, or the health of the organism. That's also good for the coloration. So this is blue. This is that kind of tealy blue uh, channel, right? All of a sudden, the coral starts to look more blue. But more importantly, the fluorescence is really popping out. And so the fluorescence isn't one of these channels. They fluoresce differently. 
It's just one coral may have fluorescence at different wavelengths than another. But the reality is it all combines together. When we combine together the C2 peak, the A peak, the carotenoid zone, and the, uh, the secondary A peak, boom, that's what we got. Does anybody here want that cool white one up the top, or they want this one? 100 out of 100, you just said this one, right? And nobody ever would ever want anything other than that one. All right, so this is, would be the options if you had these things in individually. But we would all want the, the, the really cool one. And, and the reality is, is even if I like, liked one of those other ones for some oddball reason, you probably wouldn't like it with the other corals in the tank, right? It's because there's so many in there, and we try to find the sweet spots. This is another example, cool white. All right, so this isn't, I call it a little less brown and a little bit more yellowy yellowy, greeny kind of color. And there's so much yellow and green in that light, not surprising. That means that this coral has yellow and uh, green pigment within it. All right, we add the violet. All of a sudden, the, uh, the, the uh, fluorescence comes out. But it doesn't come out just in uh, the polyps. It's also starting to come out in the tissue as well. Uh, and that brown has changed color. And then we add the, in the royal, uh, it, it royal uh, blue into uh, the cool white. All of a sudden, this tank, this coral really came alive, right? This thing is what we're all chasing. Uh, we'd all love, everybody would like a frag of this one in their house, right? Okay, when we add the blue. So the blue changes the color entirely because there's blue pigment in here, right? And the blue, it just so happens to be the carotenoid zone. You know, these things all layer together, right? These, when we help the coral, we help ourselves. And then when we build it all together, layer these all together, there's not like a hint of brown left in this coral. It's fluorescing beautifully. We have nailed the coloration. We've nailed the coral health. And yes, actually, custom one and royal blue there actually look pretty similar. If you come up, though, the royal blue actually uh, has a lot of brown still in the tissue, whereas the custom one has lost the brown. The fluorescence is more po powerful. And this is part of the way, like some people might say, oh, well, I, I just had the royal blue peak and the things look good. Yeah, but it doesn't look its best. And you're only talking about the one coral, because I just showed you another, and I got 100 corals in my tank, and I want them all to look best. And so the heart of this, again, is I believe the fish and coral success is my success. And now that you know, you can come back and look at these things, and you can see the specific peaks of wh where you should peg the coral's health. And now you can peg how it's going to look in your house as well. And in fact, I'm going to teach you that I think I could actually tell you what, co what light would look awesome without ever even seeing it on a tank. I could look at one of these spectrum charts and know not only is it going to take care of the tank, but it's actually going to take, look awesome without ever seeing it. So this is the gold standard. It's not the gold standard because it looks the best. Uh, actually, it has all this uh, really, really high teal light in it, and it's got a lot of green. And it has a, like a Windexy look. The T5 bulb, or the Blue Plus, looks like Windexy. It's also missing other colors, so it tends to only do fluorescence, and it doesn't really pick out the reds and yellows and everything else. So what will this one look like? And I can tell you right now what this one will look like. It will nail the fluorescence in the Blue Peak, but uh, like the Royal Blue Peak, but it will miss all of the rest. It's not great for the health and only OK for the coloration. This one actually, in some ways, is actually worse. We add in all that green and yellow, and really all you did now, nobody would actually use that much of it. You're going to turn it back down. So you just bought a bunch of white LEDs that are garbage and you're not even going to use. It makes no sense at all. This one, even worse. All that green and yellow in there. Uh, oddly enough, this is one of the most expensive lights in the market. right? <laughs> uh, and we have to turn the white channels just to make it like visibly OK down 80%. And when I turn down the most, most expensive lights of the market down 80%, they no longer even hit the SPS zones in a two-foot cube. Doesn't make any sense. Why would I do this? Uh, I don't know why I wouldn't buy this light looking at this thing. Uh, this one here is interesting. So you can, oops. Uh, this one here is interesting because what you can see is a big giant hump here in the A2 range, right? So that's one where you get a ton, a ton of that violet near UV. Looks cool. You'll see purple and violet come out in the tank in a way you haven't seen before. And, and I use purple and violet interchangeably, but they're totally different. Purple is actually the blend of blue and red. And so when you turn up the red lights, 
the tank actually turns purple in many cases, right? So violet is actually violet light, right? Different. Uh, but if you don't take care of your tank very well, that violet light, in my experience, is going to like fluoresce or illuminate all the garbage in your tank and make it look ha hazy. So when you have all of that near UV in there, it's been my experience when we've done a lot of testing on the less cared for tanks, that it gets this weird kind of yellowy haze uh, that it really highlights all that garbage yellow pigment in the tank that's pretty unappealing. Uh, this one, you know what this one looks like because this is the same one that you just saw in all the corals that I showed you. Now, the only difference between this one and the next one here is we moved over that binning process over from 450 and uh, I mean from four, 450 to 460, and it should be actually 10 nanometers over a little bit. Uh, now, is that a big deal? Probably not, other than the fact you're going to get a lot of that windy, windexy look again. I can look at this thing and note that I'm going to get a lot more of that light blue windexy color into the tank, right? So now, you may not be able to do it perfectly, especially if you come back and watch this thing on YouTube again and probably digest it for the second time. You could probably look at these things too and know before buying them or even without seeing them which one of these things is actually going to perform better. So that's the thing you need to know, is chlorophyll A peaks at 425. That's a violet to New Year V color. Chlorophyll C2 peaks around 450. Uh, cool white to royal blue, all of them have it. Probably not a big deal. Carotenoid zone is actually really big, but it's the blue end of it that's commonly missed. The wider, the better for the coral in most cases, and the wider, the better for you, because it has more color representation as well and you have controls over those individual peaks to create your desired look in the tank. What I'm not telling you to go out and have permission to do is change it like willy-nilly by the day. Because what you're going to do is the organism is going to try to adjust its ratio of C2 and A and everything in there to match what you've done. So build it to something you like and leave it the hell alone. So you have those things not because it's a toy, but because you can tweak it. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, to par now is very closely related to watts. So if I pick a coral that has a, a spectrum out there that has a spectrum that I like, and I was choosing this one between another one and then weighing it against the dollars, well, if one of them does 90 watts and has that spectrum and a very similar spectrum and one does 60, I can get a pretty rough estimate of how much, not the exact number of par, but the light output that it's going to give me, right? I can use that as input into making my decisions for this stuff. Congrats. You are all nerdy as me now. Uh, <laughs> you have now uh, learned something new about lighting. Uh, so I'd like to keep all that stuff that we learned about why we switch from T5s to LEDs, put it in the past. It's gone, man. It's uh, behind us. We're going to think about how we manage to the corals uh, in the future. And that's lesson 3B, uh, RSS environmental monitoring. Now that we understand the li uh, how this all works together, Let's think about how we can monitor this stuff. And monitoring means select goal parameters, methods of confirming them, and solutions to notify us when the parameters stray. So this is photosynthetic lighting. Uh, if you weren't a ma guess manual intensity, intensity, who here thinks that they could guess par fairly accurately by the eye? Raise your hand. Thank God, nobody. All right. <laughs> Okay, uh, I know that because I actually made people do it at the office once. I had them pick six, diff or six different lighting uh, uh, sessions or, or elements. It was high par, medium par, low par, and we did it in the blue range and we did it in the white range. We made them leave the room, come back, guess. Uh, and some of the best people that should be the best at this in the building couldn't do it. Uh, Jason was only able to do two of six, meaning four of them he got wrong. Uh, Jen, who has been doing this longer than me, uh, owns a, a maintenance install company uh, and a fish, the, biggest, the best fish store in Minnesota, was only able to do one uh, of six. And you know why? Because she would never guess, man. She's using a meter. Uh, <laughs> uh, Brent who tests these lights for a living. He's the guy that does all of our, uh, our uh, uh, testing uh, for PAR. He's probably measured more PAR than anybody on the planet in terms of relief, uh, reef tanks. Uh, he was only able to get uh, two-thirds of them right. Mark got zero, Josh got two, Adam got one. So I think it's rough, uh, fair to say this is 70% luck, 30% skill. You can add a little bit in. But that was just guessing. We gave him another chance to do this, and we asked them to actually go tune it. Right? So not just guess what it is, but like, how do I actually do this? Because at this point, now I have a reference point. 
I know what the light is, I know a little bit about it, and now I can slide it up and down, you know, to pick, and I know what 80% means, and I know what 30% means to some degree. Uh, Jason got half of them, Jen now got zero. Uh, Brent, who does this for a living, got zero. He's highlighted for a reason, poor Brent. Uh, Mark uh, got five, bravo to Mark. Uh, Josh got four, and Adam got two. And so the reality is I think this kind of matches like what people do. If you go onto the average forum or a group of people who are like, oh, I guess my corals are just fine. You also find a bunch of people that said, oh, I think I killed some stuff. And some people are somewhere in the middle there, right? OK, well, uh, we set these things up. These corals don't just die. There was something wrong with the environmental conditions that we created. And the problem was we were guessing. All right, so the reason why this doesn't work, by the way, is, uh, by the way, is because the human eye is not designed to be a measurement tool for this. The human eye is actually designed specifically, if you look at something bright, to make it less bright. If you look at something dark, make it brighter. Uh, it's the way that you like, experience the world. If it did it under, uh, any other way, we'd never be able to go outside or go into any dark room. Also, down below is a sensitivity chart. So this is how the eye perceives light. Green is what we perceive as brightness. So green, whoops. Uh, green right there is how uh, the eye actually uh, takes this energy in versus blue. But the blue is barely represented on this chart, which means it would take 10 times as much blue to be able to perceive the human eye as the same brightness as white. And why I might set up a tank in the SPS zone in a totally blue tank, and you might think it's actually in the LPS zone. And I might be able to set up a LPS uh, tank uh, with white light and have you think that it's actually as bright as an SPS tank. The human eye is just a terrible tool for this. So uh, what I would tell you to do, if you wanted to uh, not use a meter or anything like that, is probably go watch the BRS TV Investigates where we test all of these things. We build it out in a you know, 60 cube in a 120 gallon tank. And then we tell you what settings it is. You may not have a 120 gallon tank, but you can at least apply that to it. Or find somebody else that has produced the type of results you want and emulate them. Spectrum. This is incredibly difficult to do accurately by eye. What are those charts that I just taught you? Do you think you could actually look at the thing and then figure out what the spectrum chart is? There's just zero chance. There's no way you could do that. Uh, so uh, the reality is, though, luckily, most of the better lights out there have a preset. I don't actually have to do that. You know, I think of like the Kessel logic, right? They've already done it for me, right? I think of the AB blue plus plus settings and stuff that everybody uses. These are already done. But, and note that changes to that are probably more likely to hurt than help, especially the type of changes that people do when they're just you know, flipping switches trying to figure it out. But now that you understand what you're trying to do with uh, those spectrums and how those different peaks work, you can actually change it and do it intelligently and probably not harm anything as long as you leave it alone. All right, informed though. Who has used a PAR meter in this room? Wow. That's more than I would have thought, actually. Uh, bravo to all of you. Uh, today, you can actually just buy one of these things. You can uh, share it with all of your friends, bring it to your local club, have 60 people use it, uh, and then you can return it to us for 100 bucks. Uh, that's a pretty good deal. And I, if you think this is like a profit center, you're wrong, because it would take like a year just to pay off this thing. Right? It's just a service. We want you to be able to be able to set these things up intelligently. So use it. Use it for two months, figure it out, send it back, pay 100 bucks, it's yours. And so in that spirit of it's better to disappoint people with the truth and appease them with a lie, not using a PAR meter to put your animals in a lower success pool, and it's a disservice for me to tell you otherwise. Use the PAR meter, please. Uh, informed spectrum. No one owns a spectrometer. Those things cost 1500 bucks. Right, uh, the cheap one. Uh, good one's like 3,000 bucks. Uh, just use BRS TV. We shoot the things, almost every light. Uh, pester me if there's a light that you know, we haven't done that's really important to you. Uh, but the manufacturers typically have specs. You can go look at them. Most of them are pretty honest. And you can use what you learned today to answer these questions. And then automated. So you think of automated, and I would think of it as like, well, the right answer is like, go get a PAR meter, right? and then like set it up to uh, my Apex or a querying controller or whatever it might be and monitor the PAR. But not really. Uh, better than that, we just turn it on. Like all, every querying controller out there now, like or any good one, manages uh, or uh, uh, monitors the power output or a consumption of these lights, right? So as long as this thing, in this case, 
is taking 70 watts, I know it's performing the same way it was yesterday as it was tomorrow, presumably that I didn't change the spectrums and stuff in a way that produced the exact same power consumption, which would never happen. Uh, so uh, if you want to know that your lights are actually working and they're on and they're doing what they're supposed to do and they're in the range that they're supposed to do, which is the thing you set up yesterday, just monitoring how many watts this thing takes. And it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be even this thing. It could be like one of those little $30 kilowatts you plug in the wall, just plug it in and see, I guess. Uh, but the reality of it is uh, why would the light go wrong? Why would I want to know? And in this case, you've got to think like five years. Not what's going to happen tomorrow, because nothing's going to happen tomorrow. What's going to happen over many years? Again, we're not trying to keep uh, the guy, the astronaut in space for 300 days. We're trying to keep him up for as long as you want is the answer, right? So stuck on or forgot, or stuck or forgot off. This really isn't that big of an issue because the corals are starving in that case. But who here wouldn't notice if their tank's lights weren't on? I think all of us would because it's the way that you consume this uh, or appreciate the tank visually, right? Uh, the only exception to that is probably a vacation. So vacation, that's rare. But the reality is, is everything bad go happens at a vacation, right? Uh, I don't know why that is. It could be just bad luck and karma. It could also be that for some reason, or not for some reason, this happens to be the point in time when the person that knows the least about this tank is actually taking care of it, which isn't me. Uh, it's somebody else. Uh, however, stuck or forgot on, this can easily go unnoticed for days and cause the corals to bleach very rapidly. Anybody ever left their tank lights on un uh, uh, without, uh, uh, not on purpose? Anybody here? OK, yeah, raising some hands uh, cautiously. Uh, the reason that this most commonly happens is uh, my buddy Elliot comes over to my house. We have a barbecue. Uh, we eat our brats, and then he wants to see the tank. And it's now 9 o'clock, and the lights are off, and I turn them on. We go have another beer, and I forget. And they're just stuck on now. And the fact is I may, not, or may or may not notice. Uh, so this one can easily go unnoticed for days. And the reason that you would notice it is because you come up to the tank and stuff is dying. Uh, because you're not necessarily always there to see at the time when it's supposed to be turned off. So that power monitoring is, hey, this light's on when it shouldn't be. It's off when it shouldn't be. And then set high or low. You know, I decided willy-nilly to change the things just because Terrence is over and I wanted to show him some cool things. Uh, and then we haven't had a beer and I forgot again. Uh, and like, that doesn't sound like something that you guys would probably do in many cases. But you got to think, like, will that ever do that in the next few years? And the answer is yes for a lot of people. Uh, all of this stuff will happen. Uh, uh, but this also might be a rare occurrence where monitoring might be better than redundant control. I don't actually want to turn these lights on and off constantly with uh, controllers. I might actually just be OK with uh, having a uh, notification on my phone saying, Hey, it's 1 o'clock. Go turn those things off, dude. You forgot. Or I wake up in the morning, I look at my Wordle first, and then I realize that, uh, you know what, uh, there's a message on there telling me to go turn this thing off. Uh, and so uh, there is an option for real-time PAR. And there's that PAR monitor there. So if you wanted to actually measure it in the tank or you know, figure out your DLI, you know, like not just what the PAR is, but how it actually like scopes up and down, you wanted to get really nerdy with it, you could do that. This isn't the primary thing, the most important thing that I would look at. Uh, so lesson uh, 2C, environmental management design. Right? This is the next piece of this. NASA engineers and builds systems to spec. So you can't go buy a space shuttle off the shelf. You have to design that thing. The, you have to design uh, pieces of the International Space Station. Uh, Reefer is design and spec, but we use readily available tools. And so this is what they look like. So does anybody think that you can use small gr uh, modules in a grid to light virtually any tank? Because I do. Uh, medium module, large module, light strips, three-point lighting, uh, LED fixtures. All of these things will work. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. All of these things you could use to light a tank and do it exceptionally well. They're just going to be better in some cases than others. Uh, and you need to know, understand how the tools work. So forget the brands. It's about right tool, right job. Let's do it the first time. Uh, so this is a smaller tank. And we have a small module. 
So this is your AI primes, your Kessels, all those things, your tiny little modules. They're convenient, easy to install. They work really great on uh, small tanks like this one. You can see uh, in this tank, it's a 60 gallon cube. We found that AI prime will fill up that whole thing. This is a $200 light, covers a two foot tank. I could probably use two even on a big tank if it's just an LPS tank. Uh, this is what it looks like on a 40 breeder. You can see how all the intersecting lights can actually spread over 18 inches a piece, and it's going to fill this light up. This is going to work really well. It also works really great for shimmer, right? So the way that shimmer works is really intense start, uh, uh, amounts of light hitting the ripples on the surface. So if you spread that light out, it doesn't create as much. If you bring it into a little hole, it'll bring a shimmer. But also, sometimes it's too harsh. So some people won't like it because it actually just kind of gives you a seizure. It's, it's so, you know, much movement. What it's supposed to look like is glitter from the sun. You know, it's just it's supposed to look like it brings it to life. Uh, and and when e easy access is a priority, right tool. You know, like who doesn't want to make, you remember the T5 fixture? I had to like somehow get that thing out of the way to get in the tank here. I'm in. I'm out. The only thing that I couldn't get out of here is the whole aquascape. Uh, and there's tank mounts for everything. This is actually an important note because mounting it, I actually surveyed people at one point in time. What was the most important thing about what light I would choose? And they said the mounting solution, uh, which is, by the way, for them, not the animals. <laughs> but like, I, was, I was like, wow, I understand the thought process here because I actually want this to be easy, right? And so this is part of why these little modules are so popular. It's a challenging tool, though, when a dream SPS tank is the goal, and you happen to hate cords, and you happen to hate complicated installs, because you're going to install a lot of lights, a lot of cords, adjusting them all, and there's probably simpler ways. Now, this might be the most advanced cool way, actually, because in this case, that grid is set up to over a 120, that each one of these lights is only covering a 12-foot area, like or, uh, a 1-foot area, 12 inches. So eventually, I divided my tank up into eight little zones that I could zone out. And it's probably the coolest way, but it's also one of the more complicated ways to do it. All right, so that was a small module. What happens when we go to a medium module, which is probably one of the more popular forma uh, formats as well? Uh, in this case, you can just see it, that uh, the larger form factor actually just covers more of the tank. And what that's going to do is if I had a tiny little light on the top of this thing and it's shooting down, underneath here is shadowed. If I have a big old light, right, the light just wraps around the object, right? So when I get a bigger light, all of a sudden it illuminates things much more evenly uh, and it's easier. Uh, saying it has the same easy access and fewer cords. This is a good example, actually, that there's a larger medium-sized module is the AI64, right? You might have thought that that grid of eight of those primes is actually silly. Well, two 64s isn't silly. Why? Because it's the same actual eight pucks <laughs> that's in there. Eight, we just spread them out to make it perform better for the animals, right? Uh, and they're also now all the high-end options are all ultra-wide, right? So the high-end options, now, instead of focusing them down like that foam, that picture that we saw before, which shoots things down 30, you got to light your, put your lights you know, three feet above the tank. Now it's ultra wide. And so instead of using that lens to lens it out, what we actually put is a new lens on top of it that actually tried to widen it out from the original lens even wider. And the net result here is in that two-foot grid here, the four-inch ring in the center is 455 par. And on the very edge, 409. A difference of 50 par from here to here, just six inches deep in the tank. That's what progress looks like in uh, lighting. When we go from the old world to the new world, that is what everybody is shifting to. Uh, and if you're looking for an SPS or mixed tank, so just for you know, this is the 750, the worldwide tank, uh, uh, hybrid tank that we run. This is the lighting solution. There's four of those things. It's a simple, easy install. I can still get in it. You can see why this is an attractive thing to a lot of people and why a lot of different reefers install this. But also, the results are also undeniable. Right? It's a different solution than some of the other things, especially for me, who's used a lot of three-point lighting with T5s. This is one of my first experiences using LED only and actually producing better results than what I was uh, getting before. Uh, 
<laughs> this one's really funny, actually. So it's a challenging tool when low cost is the number one priority, because these modules are really expensive, right? But actually, there's a catch-22 to this, is that if you actually divide the average par out of the whole cube, all 96 points, by the cost, these things are actually the cheapest. Uh, so it's kind of like if you bought a car that was 150 horsepower for 30 grand, and then you buy another one that was 90, uh, 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 90 grand but had 450 horsepower. If horsepower was the only thing that mattered to me, that was actually the same exact value. Uh, it's just that that thing cost 90,000. In this case, uh, I don't really need horsepower to go fast. Uh, I need it to provide energy to the coral. So they are expensive, but if you're, uh, you have to define how you're going to decide what expensive really means. Uh, uh, the large modules. All right. So large modules, you're going from medium, and now I'm going to super big. All right. Okay. Uh, the right tool when you're trying to replace something like a halide. So the halide reflectors were big old boxes, right? And that was the size of the object that was illuminating our tank. But it was also this thick, and it was in a giant hood, and it created a ton of heat. Or I could have an option like this one that's an inch thick, right? And uh, it has the same illuminating surface. So uh, uh, it's also a good option if you have the same number of modules, but you want a blanket of light. This tank is four feet wide and about five and a half feet wide, so it's roughly about every two feet. I've got one of these things spaced. It's the same thing that most people would do with the medium-sized modules, which is about one every two feet. But you can see this thing covers the entire surface of the tank like a blanket, right? And you can see how it would wrap light, so a little bit different. Uh, it's going to reduce shadows. So these are some of the things that we do uh, at the office, because this is what we do all day. We're nerds. Uh, we hold the lights up. And this is an aquascape that's built for a 120-gallon tank. You would normally put two over them. And the only places that you have shadows are in the most obvious places possible, which is like under the big giant plating coral at the bottom. And they're even there, they're kind of soft. However, those are two small form factor lights that are over there. And now I can see shadows virtually everywhere, and hard shadows where I can actually see like, the actual imprint of the coral. And I can see it not just on the bottom, but I can see it on other corals. I can see it on the aquascape. It's shading the things next to it, under it, and in it. So when we get an object that's larger than uh, the objects we're trying to illuminate, we do it a better job. Uh, in some cases, it's actually cheaper, because if I was going to light a 120-gallon uh, reef tank with a medium-sized module, I'd probably use three. Uh, in this case, I would probably only use two, which means I can actually cut the cost of this down by 30-some percent and probably get the exact same type of result. Uh, and it's a challenging tool, though, here when uh, you, it's a ease of install is a coin flip because there aren't a lot of uh, mounting options for some of these larger modules, like that uh, uh, the one from ATI and a couple of the other ones. And you know that that the one from uh, Orphic is heavy. It's big, man. It's cool, but it's it's got some meat to it. And it's heavy. And so uh, when uh, Terence here actually launched the sky here, he used the, what he's called a universal bracket that happened to be the same bracket that Ecotech used. Uh, at the time, I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, but <laughs> uh, uh, what happened really is that you can use the readily available mounting solutions that are already out there. And for those of you who don't know, you could actually probably measure the total volume of, of uh, lighting sold simply by the amount of uh, mounting options are there because there are, these things are super expensive to make. You have to get all of these molds made for all these individual parts, and they're really expensive. And the only way that you could ever do it is if you're selling a massive amount of lights. So if you want to know what the number one most popular lights are, go look and see who has the most mounting options. It's that person for sure. <laughs> but in the end, no, I actually really like this idea. Because uh, I was able to swap out uh, uh, some radions from skies on a tank, and I didn't have to replace anything. It was just the four bolts. Now imagine if our hobby actually picked up the universal bolting scenario, where they all did this. Wouldn't that be a wonderful world? Hopefully you created it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right. Strip lights. Uh, I think I asked earlier, there wasn't a single one of these strip lights on their tank as the primary light. 
uh, but they look like this. You can bolt them together and create a grid that looks awful a lot like a T5 fixture. Uh, you can actually get these hybrid modules, but in reality, that's just two strip lights that are bolted together, and if you wanted to put something in the middle, you could. Uh, and then there's all these other strip lights out there. The right tool, well, because they uh, have options for most of the available price points out there. You can get cheap ones, you can get expensive ones. Uh, and the strips are super easy to install. You just set it down. Uh, it's like you put it right on the top of the tank, it's really easy. Often you just plug it in the wall. It's really, really easy. Uh, the part that most of you probably wouldn't know is this actually had the best distribution of any light we've ever tested. It was just like, I think, five of those bars bolted together in their little bracket. And 87% uh, of the light uh, was all in the SPS zone. And then when we did it for SPS, it was all 83% of the light was all in the right zone. If this isn't the best, I mean, we're missing it by a couple of points one way or another. This is one of the best performing lights we've ever tested in this zone. Uh, and it actually wasn't really any more expensive than most of the other options out there. And when I look at this, I question, why is it that nobody does it this way? You know, why are we just skipping over this option that actually is so easy to install and get right and looks so much like the form factor of the old that wraps objects in light? I don't know. Uh, it also works for migrating from T5s. So this is a little shot here we did of I wanted to know what the difference of one of these strips would do versus a T5 bulb. And uh, like, does it distribute light differently? Because those bulbs have a pretty optimized reflector on them. And the answer is actually dead the same. Meaning we go from 95 to 57 in the center and 74 to 43, we lost 40% of the light. From a single strip light going in the middle of a tank all the way to the edges, we only lost 40% difference from the dead center, which is pretty cool. It's distributing light. But a T5 bulb and one of these LED D strips doing the exact same thing. Uh, only real difference was is the average total par with the Reef Bright Authentic Blue was 71 and the uh, T5 bulb was 51. So it actually just puts out a lot more light than uh, the, the T5 bulb did. All right. So this is a challenging tool when uh, intensity control is there. There's a lot of really wonky ways to ramp these things up and down. I installed one on my tank and I hated it. Uh, Reef Bright's like option for dimming them is this big giant brick and I had eight million cords. If you followed Facebook, I mean, you'd see how many cords it was. It was insane. Uh, so they needed better options. Some of the spectrum options for these things are really designed around just being a, a 10x to pop things because not a single person here is using this light this way. Uh, so if you're not buying them that way. In fact, I had this thing made for us because after we did the, the results on it, I was like, man, I don't know why people aren't using this because it was so easy and it was so good. Let's bolt these things together so you don't have to do it at your home. Uh, you can find them now on our site on clearance because nobody bought them. <laughs> <laughs> I got in trouble for that one. Uh, all right. Three-point lighting. Anybody here use three-point lighting? <laughs> well, maybe you just don't know what it is. Yeah, anybody here use LEDs and T5s that together? Well, that's, you. that's a lot of you. All right, so uh, three-point lighting. It's the right tool when you want to produce something like that. That's the E170. It was produced using uh, three-point lighting, which is a Kessel in the T5s. It's a great tool when you want to produce something like that. That's the BRS160. It's using Kessel lighting and T5s on the side. It's also the right solution if you want to produce something like that, which is a 900-gallon tank that used to be over at uh, 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 Worldwide before they moved. Uh, it was T5s and uh, 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 a primary light as well. All right. So what T5 or what, what three-point lighting is is one single light in the center as your primary tool, and then we have backfill light shining on the back and front lighting shining on the front. And so what we have is three points of light creating something unique, right? This has been some of the most successful methods for me because it's blanketing the coral and light. It's also to some degree uh, uh, adjustable. To give you an idea, this is where I got the thought process from the three-point lighting a long time ago. This is called hard lighting. When I have one small uh, for, sort of form of light, it creates that giant shadow uh, behind this guy. Uh, and so everything, everything in our hobby is borrowed technology from somewhere else. Uh, but I'm borrowing from tough photography now. Uh, here, where did that shadow go? 
Well, this is three-point lighting. This light is now got a light behind him, it's a light in front of him, and a primary focus light to create shaping. And so this is one of the cool things about three-point lighting too, is it's not just a big giant blanking of light, because you could create something similar if I just got a light that was bigger than the guy himself, and it would wrap around him too. But what if I want shaping? What if I want not just a super flat, boring image? What if I want just a little bit of contrast? Not shadows that would harm the coral, but shadows that kind of create a 3D image and effect and contrast in the tank. I can create that. That guy right there, see how his face is just a little bit shadowed and then on the side? It creates an a interesting image or a look. And this is how we consume these things. So three-point lighting is really awesome. Again. You can see the difference between what happens when we create shadowing with hard light and when we use soft light over here. And this can be created in two ways. It can be because I have a big giant array of light or it can be done uh, with three-point lighting or a big huge surface. All right. Also, you get the perfect shimmer. This one here doesn't have like a, an obnoxious shimmer. It's not making uh, me go crazy looking at it. It also brings in the effect of the sun. If you're snorkeling, it brings the whole thing alive. and makes me feel like I'm taking a piece of Fiji and sticking it in my home. And the reason that I can do that is because I have the three-point lighting. I'm going to create the shimmer with the primary light sources that are hard and compact, and then the fill light I can get the exact look that I'm looking for. Some of you might like it a little bit more busy, and some of you might like it more soft. The answer is you could do either. You get to create it to your own effect. Uh, and it's also adjustable to non-adjustable sources. So in my case, uh, I don't like the color of the teal uh, T5 ATI blue lights. Well, now I can add the Kessels in, and I can crank those blue lights up to change the spectrum mix into something that's appealing for myself. Uh, and again, I now can change out the uh, T5s uh, that I have in there with LEDs if I want in the three-point lighting. A lot of people think of this as a, 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 T5, or a hybrid, has to be T5 and LEDs. That's not true. It has to be fill light combined with a hard light. That's the hybrid element. doesn't really matter. There's no magic T5 photon. Uh, all right. It's a challenging tool when you want it to look clean without a hood. Because all these options are pretty wonky. They got a lot of car, uh, cords on them. They tend to look kind of industrial. Uh, it's also, you got a lot of cords. Uh, you're missing advanced controls. And to be honest, I don't know why we're still thinking about this as a hybrid solution. I'm glad they exist. But why doesn't anybody make a fixture of three-point lighting? Terrence, do you remember one that exists? Yeah. What is it? Oh, you're right. He did have that. Uh, sun pack or somewhere. But also, uh, this one, uh, Pacific Sun had one. Uh, also, this guy right here, Maxpect. They had it. They have all those little pucks going down the center. And then fill lights coming out the side. It was called a recurve. Never tested it. You know why I never tested it? Because I thought that there was a magic T5 photon fairy. I, I don't know, man. I just wasn't in the space. I just loved my T5s, and they were working for me. And I wanted to continue to learn from my successes in the past and then pass them on. And if you asked me what worked, I wanted to tell you what worked for me, not some mythical thing of this it could work, right? Uh, I now regret that. And uh, I don't know if they still sell this thing or not, but I think I want to order one and find out. <laughs> uh, all right, LED fixtures. Uh, we talked about the Illumina. That ship sailed. That one's gone. Uh, there aren't really that many options here. And I think it's just because nobody buys them. Because uh, the reality is all of this stuff, what's popular, isn't what the manufacturers make popular. It's what we buy. What we buy is what makes it popular. Uh, and so uh, there's a couple options out there. There's Aquamax. There is the Reef Breeders. There is the Razor. Uh, and if I had to pick one uh, of all the ones that we tested, when we tested the Razor, I said to myself, why isn't this more popular? Because this was so darn easy, right? You set it up there, put it on the legs, and there was like little controls on the side. I didn't have to mess with my phone. It was really easy. But it's just not popular. Uh, and uh, it's a challenging tool because uh, there's no intermediate to high-end options. So if you really are into like high-end technology and stuff, it just doesn't kind of exist. Uh, there's a lot of artifacts from many of these. like. 
artifacts of lighting, meaning disco effects, you, like you know, with options that have lenses on them, you're going to see the green and red shooting around all over the place. And maybe you don't care. I do. It just drives me crazy. When I know what good looks like, when I see bad, it's really hard. I, sends off my ADD. Uh, uh, and mounting legs are sometimes more for aesthetics than the health of the corals. So a lot of these people are designing these things because they know you want to mount them a couple inches off the tank, even though they don't perform that well there. And so the legs actually shouldn't be used. The one exception I'd say again is uh, the max spec uh, razor here. Those legs you can see are much taller. And bravo to them, because I know that they would think that they would, it would look better if it was smaller, but they're designing it in a way that actually is going to do well for the corals. And for those of you who are wondering, one of the spectrum shots that we saw earlier that had that huge violet color in there, that was that one. So if you were looking for a lot of violet in there and you wanted a lot of near UV, that was the most of any light we've ever tested it was a max spec razor. All right. So this is a question that everybody would normally ask me after this, which is, which one would you up buy or use? <laughs> right? How do you assemble all this into your own thing? Uh, and uh, for me, that would depend on the install. But I would probably try to replicate the successes that I've had in the past. It just, I think, makes sense. Uh, I will tell you, though, I'm done with the T5 bulbs. I, I won't use them. I don't believe that they are, uh, there's a magic T5 photon anymore. Uh, uh, now that I know it, the only thing I really need to worry about is intensity. I need to worry about spectrum, and I need to worry about coverage. If I get those things right, uh, the magic uh, uh, T5 fairy will leave me alone. Uh, and the only reason for that is twofold, actually. One, uh, I do like cool stuff. I'm addicted to it. Uh, leave me alone. But also, uh, the <laughs> also the fact these T5 bulbs are not going to be around for very long. So if you're going to go buy a T5 fixture, uh, go buy 10 years worth of bulbs because they're going to go away. Uh, and uh, if you wonder, go to Home Depot and see if you can find yourself a T5 bulb, bulbs these days. They just don't exist. And they're going away rapidly, which means the primary manufacturing plant that makes these things for places that produce tons of them and then just once in a while makes them for us are just going to go off the planet. And almost all of them are made in uh, uh, Europe. And in Europe, they're super, super tight about environmental controls. And these all things filled with mercury. Uh, they're just going to stop making these things. So T5 bulbs are moving into the new technology world. And the reason that I'm able to do that and free my wings is because of the experience with uh, uh, the 700 and the WWC method. We've now seen the results. I now know what I can do. It doesn't necessarily mean that I would use those modules in every case. Uh, but the answer is what you're going to see in the 52 weeks of reefing season two is we're going to set up probably 10 different tanks. And we're going to make probably 10 different uh, uh, decisions based on the animals that are there. Because I don't want to make uh, uh, decisions that are based on uh, brand preference. I want to make a decision based on capability of the light to fill the need that I have. Uh, the last bit here is NASA builds uh, our uh, lesson 3D, management environmental control. NASA builds custom environmental controls. We pick from the tools designed for us. And again, now option number one, I couldn't believe this. I did this uh, video with uh, Victor from Worldwide. You guys haven't seen it yet. But he told me that a huge chunk of people that come in the store control their lights by plugging and unplugging them. OK, I, now I've made it totally unsafe for anybody in here to say that, uh, that they actually do that. I was like, wow, I'd never even heard that. I couldn't believe that that was true, that that is what you would do. Is you, you, every morning you walk up and plug them in? I mean, a timer, dude, costs 20 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, OK, so that's the control system here. Maybe you do that. I would actually go by the timer. Uh, and so the timer can look like that. Uh, these are the types of lights you would turn a timer on and off with your fluorescent lighting, some of the LED strips and the Kessels. Kessels have other options, but you would just put these on a timer. It could be built into your controller, you know, your Apex or whatever it might be. It could also just be a timer. But I'll, uh, I would say if you're going to do this the first time, evaluate how many timers you're going to end up buying for your whole system, because you might find that that's actually just a $100 coupon off of a better controller system, because they all have timers built in. Uh, and uh, you can also do it automated with the onboard controller. So uh, uh, the Mitris, the uh, Razor, uh, to a limited degree, the Radeon. I don't know. Those buttons don't do a whole lot. Uh, then also you could buy an external controller if you want to pay extra money for the Kessel to do that. 
Who here prefers their f uh, uh, a uh, external controller or onboard controller over the phone? Raise your hand. I mean, I like there's like five people, uh, but I'm definitely one of them. I, I, I literally like to walk up to the thing and just push the buttons and have it do what I want it to do. Uh, I don't want to wake up my phone and figure it out, go find my phone, come back, blah, blah, blah. And I got to, you know, sometimes uh, some of these things, like uh, with the Kessel, I just have never gotten the little Wi-Fi dongle to work for me the way that I would like it to. So I'm always dealing with like connection issues and stuff. Uh, in fact, when I use the Kessels, I use that spectral controller, which is a box I plug in with a wire. Uh, it just works better for me all the time. So uh, a difference. The difference is between the different lights. But there are also options like this. So the more robust options uh, where I can go up and I can have all the fun GUI and I can draw the lines up and send them up and down in real time. And the cool part about this then is really that it is real time. Like I wouldn't want to go up to my buddy and like mess with my max spec light onboard controlling and change the colors for them because I would have to go change it all back. But with something like a GUI like this, we're like, oh, look what happens when we turn all the royal blues on. Look what we do for just a second. And I'm not talking about health in that case because the coral doesn't care what you do for the next 10 minutes, you know. Uh, but you can show and highlight these corals in a different way. So some of these onboard GUIs are pretty cool. It's a different way to control it. Uh, there's also uh, aquarium controller ready. So all of these things are controller ready in some ways, just from the inner on and off function. But there's things like the sky or anything that runs on 0 to 10 volt where I can actually create different uh, wavelengths. And one of the things I didn't mention earlier is some of you may want to experience your corals in different light. Like I do want to you know, change the spectrums because I want to see them differently. Well, notice here, uh, this is actually my tank. And I have it AB plus in the morning. In the middle, it's Neptune sky. And in the bottom, it's AB plus again. So it actually changes the spectrum throughout the day, much the way the sun does. So it emulates the sun. And it will adjust to that. It will adjust to the fact that it's getting different amounts of photons throughout the day. What it won't adjust to is drastic changes all the time. So if you want to experience these things differently, this is probably one of the better ways to do it. You wouldn't be able to do it with onboard controlling. You have to do it in your controller or within like your app type functions. Uh, that's at 0 to 10 volt. So these are like getting increasingly rare to, to use. There's not a lot of applications for it. But basically, it sends a little signal and ramps things up and down. All right. Redundancy, because uh, life support's here, it all matters. Uh, if one thing goes, everything goes. Uh, there is a, a timer function. You could actually just turn the lights off. I could just set it to turn off at 10 p.m. and turn on at, uh, uh, at uh, you know, I guess, you create an eight-hour cycle within the timer, right? So that could be right outside of my normal function. So I could you trust the lights controller to turn on and off and then put a timer on both ends of it to make sure that it's off really easy. And with a good light, it should withstand that. The crappier lights probably won't uh, take it as well because you're power cycling it 700 times. You're wearing out the little capacitor in there that has the, the uh, it keeps the time stamp inside of it. So the crappy light, I'd probably let it just control and I would use my monitoring solution. But in this case, you could do the light. Uh, and uh, again, an instance where monitoring might be better if you have a poor quality light uh, than a big one. Uh, but uh, there is other controls that I would do, which is I would set up a temperature controller on this thing. So I turn the light off if uh, it was ever hot in the tank. So this is a little bit of a different question and it gets into the lighting schematic or the, the thermal energy schematic. But I would turn this off. Uh, because if the tank is going up to 85 degrees because the air conditioning broke in my house, it's better that they have no light than it hits 90, guaranteed. All right, so what's next? Well, we have the uh, uh, simplified pollution schematic, the why. We have the schematic for all of those other things. When we put it all together, this is what you're going to see in the 52 weeks or even season two. We're going to go through all of these schematics. We're going to build out what all of this means and how it works together. And then we're going to install it on a whole slew of different tanks. I haven't picked out all the tanks yet. Uh, you guys should tell me, uh, stop up here and tell me afterward, throw in the comments. Uh, but that's season two and a taste of what's to come. Uh, these are the tanks that I'm thinking about right now. Uh, I'm thinking about a deep water NPS tank. 
So I'm thinking about a tank that uh, would prefer to be somewhere around 70 degrees. I'm thinking about a tank that has uh, non-photosynthetic corals in it. Uh, thank you, Elliot. You're the inspiration. Because I got a bunch of tank fish in here that actually would do better because they come from you know, 300 feet down in a colder tank. I'd be a better pet owner if I provided the right environment for them than I am right now. And these fish are actually you know, pretty rare, but we're actually breeding them now. So they're not sending somebody down 300 feet anymore to go get them, and they're going to become increasingly popular as people pick them up. So let's do some cool things like that. A, a, a Japanese acro tank. So let's not just build another SPS tank. Let's build an acro tank in that kind of negative space a, a Japanese look. Build out the aquascape and the flow and all of the stuff that makes it look really cool and unique. Let's do a frag tank. What does a frag tank look like when it actually looks nice? Let's do a flowy tank. Again, thank you, Elliot, for your term flowy. Uh, and so for me, there's an LPS tank, and then there's a flowy tank, meaning I got euphilia in there, I got torches in there, I got brains in there, and everything in there either moves or jiggles, right? Uh, and so uh, I want to build out an entire tank that does that. I can make different decisions for flow and filtration and all of these things for that. How about a mangrove? tank with clams in it. So one of those lagoon tanks that has the cool outcropping of mangroves and then filled with a look down display of clams. Let's build something out like that. Let's build an aggressive fish tank. I mean, I don't know why I just skipped over fish tanks in its entirety and went straight to reef. Uh, I, I, sometimes I feel like when I talk about fish tanks, people are going to shame me or something. But I'm actually getting like really into it. And all my whole life, I've actually really wanted a tank with a big old dragon eel and lionfish in it. Like seeing that eel, man, is so creepy. And it's just like a little bit dark. And that way that lionfish is just kind of floating in there and just swallows guys up whole. It's cool. I really, really like it and enjoy it. Let's do a big fish only tank with all angels in it. Let's do a fish only small tank. Like, uh, let's just fill the whole thing up with uh, uh, tiny little antheas. And in fact, the Japanese acro tank, maybe we can fill it up with all of those blue chromis. And we can watch the chromis as a school dart in and out of uh, uh, the acros in a way that's really natural and cool. Let's do the clownfish harem in an enemy tank. But this tank, let's do a time to do it in a different manner. Let's do different anemones. Let's do the rotator anemones. Let's carpet anemones. Let's do maybe a four-foot cube tank uh, or square tank where I can have them swim out and around and provide better habitat for them and maybe a tank that doesn't look like it's going to explode on me. Uh, uh, let's do a desktop tank or a nano tank. I've never actually done a series on a nano tank, most requested tank of all time. And then, I don't know, this is a weird one. Should we do a mixed tank? Because it's the most popular tank known to man, but I also feel like been there, done that. So I don't know. Uh, add in the tanks that you'd like to see us do in the 52 weeks of reefing season two, and we'll probably try to fit them in. Uh, at least the most popular options are the ones I happen to like the most. But I want to leave you with a thought. I want to leave you with a thought that really important to me, because all of what we've talked about today is keeping animals alive. Right? And being a better version of ourselves and a better pet owner. And if we do a better, better pet owner, the animals will actually reward us. So there are a lot of people out there that will shame all of you in this room because uh, of our hobby, our passion. They say 90%, 9% of the fish and coral will die under our care. It's not true. Uh, they say that's only true if we don't care about their environmental needs or have mentalities that promote the lack of care. So if we do things like say, oh, it's just stuff dies, this is true 100%, right? But we can choose to be different than this. And the people in this room do care. And the success is defined by our health of our animals. Many of our animals have been with us for decades and will live longer in, the than in our tanks than they will in the wild. And when we falter and fail, because we will, they'll actually only serve to have us try harder. Does anybody recognize this fish here? What is it? Clownfish. It is a clownfish. It's from the clownfish harem. I first met her when she was the size of my pinky nail. I got 30 of her brothers and sisters all together, and I put them into the clownfish uh, harem tank. We created a community of fish back in 2014. We cared for them for five years. And then when uh, we noticed the tank was bowing so bad that we had to let them out, 
now you can go around BRS and you can find a pair of these fish in tanks all over. In fact, about 15 of them uh, it would be the math. I have a pair of them in my office. Does anybody know what the behavior that she's doing right now is? <laughs> she's caring for eggs. She's laid eggs. Her and her husband have lived in under my care for eight years. We've raised them from babies. And now she's going to go on to have her own new family, right? These people are well done well under our care if we care about them, we care about how to care for them. And somebody said this really interesting thing to me today, is we should actually capture those fish, raise those eggs, and they should be the basis for the new clown harem tank in the season two of 52 Weeks of Reefing. And so that's the primary ingredient for progress, is optimism the unwavering belief that something can be better that drives reefers forward. And that will be season two, 52 weeks of reefing. We're going to make it better than it's ever been. Thank you. Uh, if anybody has any questions, catch me in the hall, because it's super hot in here. <laughs>